1, Module 2. Welcome to Module 2. Remember that this course will teach you a proven level design process that professional level designers have used on a variety of projects, from AAA console games to mobile titles. But before we get to the specific steps of the process, you need to understand my underlying design philosophy and my approach to game development. Otherwise, the steps won't make much sense. In this module, we'll dig deeply into one of the principles of my process, the concept of intention. I'll explain why intention is critical for successful design work, and I'll give you some tools to help you focus your own design goals. In the previous module, we covered a definition for level design, and we learned some important considerations for the process. Levels are the largest resource in game development. They contain gameplay and present it to the player. Instead of telling stories, games use a variety of techniques to create dramatic context for the player's actions. And of course, levels are always bound by technical constraints. There are three key areas of focus when developing level content for games. I like to call these areas of focus the three eyes. Intention, invention, and iteration. The three eyes help to form a framework for my design philosophy. And each of the eyes offers important concepts that you'll use when designing and building your own levels. We're going to start with eye number one, intention. There's a quote from the immortal Greek philosopher Plato that will help us frame the topic of intention. Plato said, the beginning is the most important part of the work. If you establish your intentions clearly and correctly at the beginning of a project, that'll enable you to make your decisions quickly and confidently later on. But if your intentions are muddy, you may find yourself spinning in circles, trying hard to improve your creative work, but with zero success. Imagine that you're a furniture designer and you're hired to make a rocking chair for someone. Now suppose that they wanted you to use only angles, no curves. Could you do it? How? What would that rocking chair look like? Now what if your next client asked you to design a rocking chair that they could use in their pool, or maybe even floating in the ocean? The rocking chair designs have a particular goal behind them, an intention. And that intention drives the choices that go into every aspect of the project. To make a great level, a designer must be clear about their intentions from the very start of the process. They need to be confident in what they're trying to achieve, and they also need to be confident in the strategies that they intend to use to accomplish those goals. Those intentions permeate every creative choice they make, and all other decisions in the process cascade from that point of clarity. To illustrate this, let's talk about the most successful level design of all time. Years ago, before I got my break into the games industry, I moved to New York City. If you've ever lived in a big city, you know how hard that first year can be. The pace is brutal and there's concrete everywhere. Sometimes it's hard to even see the sun. It was especially bad during my first winter. Harsh conditions of the city combined with the weather to make the experience feel even more draining and desolate. But as the weather got a little better, spring began to appear and a friend invited me to take a walk in Central Park. I remember being amazed as we walked through the green spaces. There were open fields with long, beautiful sight lines of distant trees and sun-dappled lawns. And off of the main lawn areas, there were twisting paths that wound over and around small hills and dips. 
The paths were visually isolated from the open spaces so that even though there were large crowds of people in the park, we felt like we were alone, walking in nature. And then there was another surprise. We rounded a bend in the path and discovered a beautiful fountain, set low to the ground and completely hidden from view. It felt like we had discovered a secret world all our own. I distinctly remember the feeling that the natural energy of Central Park was restoring my spirit. When we left, I felt calm and energized, like the beauty of the wild spaces had strengthened me to face life back on the city streets. I eventually moved away from New York City, but I never forgot the feeling that the park elicited me in that spring. In fact, it was a story that I like to relate about my experiences of living in New York. Years later, I was living in Los Angeles, and I found myself working on a project that was supposed to be set in New York City. I started to research Central Park, and I found out that I hadn't been walking in untamed nature. It turned out that every square foot of Central Park had been meticulously designed to create those feelings in me. The design of Central Park was one of the signature projects of Frederick Law Olmsted, widely considered to be the father of American landscape architecture and one of the most noted landscape designers of the 19th century. Olmsted was very particular about what his landscapes needed to accomplish, the intention behind his designs. In fact, he created seven laws to describe them. Here's Olmsted's list of design laws. If you're curious, I recommend that you look them up and read more about them on your own. His writing style is a little old-fashioned, but the principles that informed his landscape designs are laid out pretty clearly for anyone to understand. Now, I'm not telling you this to try to get you to memorize Olmsted's approach. The main point that I want you to understand is that Olmsted thought deeply about his designs and crafted his landscapes very carefully. And all of his choices while building Central Park were deliberately shaped by his intentions. And what's amazing is that Olmsted's level design and the intentions behind it continue to create the effect that he intended on visitors to Central Park to this day. It's a testament to his design that they still worked on me when I walked through them over 150 years later. By now it should be clear that all design is driven by the specific intentions of the designer. A design can be created to address anything, to be beautiful to look at, to be highly useful or functional, to use unconventional materials or shapes, the sky's the limit. As a level designer, you'll need to be specific about your intentions, both as an individual contributor and also on the project-wide level. When you're approaching a new design, you should ask yourself some clarifying questions. What is the core idea behind your design? Can you express that concept in a single paragraph? How about as a single sentence? What is exciting about that idea? Be specific. What are you personally most excited about? It could be a technical achievement or an artistic one. It could be to create a particular emotion in your player or even to recreate the feeling of being in a real place. What are the three most important things about that idea? What elements have to be present to make your concept work? Again, be as specific as you can. Are these elements important to you personally? Are they important to the entire project? Can you describe these three things? Maybe write a paragraph about each of them or perhaps make a sketch to illustrate them? How would you explain the three most important things to a child? Next, how would you rank them from least to most important? If you could only keep two, which ones would you keep? And then, of course, the tough question, what if you could only keep one? What changes about your design if you only keep the most important concept? What do you lose? What would you gain? 
Of course, there are as many different intentions as there are creators, but there are a few common needs that level designers often have to address. And over time, game developers have created approaches to solving those needs. If you put your mind to it, I bet you could name a few common solutions that many games seem to adopt. For the purpose of this class, we call these common combinations of intention and solution level themes. Think of level themes like plays and sports, or storytelling devices in books, TV, or movies. Like a blitz in football, or a pick and roll in basketball, or foreshadowing in literary fiction. These are all techniques that are well understood and used all the time. They're common tools that the pros use under certain circumstances to solve certain situational needs. Level themes fall on a continuum that shapes the content that appears in levels and can also affect the structure of the level itself. The spectrum stretches from spaces that are highly plausible and so are better suited for telling an immersive story all the way to spaces that are highly abstract, which are arguably better for building gameplay experiences. Identifying your level theme or themes is a key part of clarifying your intentions, especially at the project-wide level. We will break down the most common level themes in a later module. Right now, ask yourself the question, what am I trying to do in my level? That answer will help you refine your process once we reach the step-by-step -step stage of design. In this module, we learned about the first of the three I's, intention. We learned how important it is for designers to have clear intentions as they approach their work. And we put special focus on making sure that you are clear about your intentions at the start of the design process by outlining a set of questions that you can use as an exercise to help refine your own designs. Finally, we learned about the concept of level themes, proven solutions for commonly encountered challenges in level design. As always, be sure to bring your questions over into the Facebook forums or email me directly. And I'll see you in the next module.